Thank you everyone for coming today. Um, what I have prepared today is, if you have followed the market, you would probably have experienced that there's been a bit of a shift in terms of what it might happen in the next couple of years. And if you have followed the journey of Blue Well since we started in 2017, you would have known that we had been heavily exposed to certain opportunity within digital transformation, mostly in the US, uh, in FANGs, in some other names. But since that we have made a few transitions and are spending uh, quite big uh, stocks that we used to own a lot and then move into some new opportunities that we were not, we have not considered before. So what I try to do today is to give you a glimpse of what we are doing now and how we think uh, the portfolio could do uh, well in this current uncertain environment. So hence the, the talk is titled to a blank sheet of paper. So before I do that, just for anyone who is not familiar with uh, Blue Well Capital in terms of how we, what we do and the strategy, we run a, a single strategy, a, a high conviction portfolio of about 25 to 35 stocks. And there are five of us on the investment team we do all the research in-house. We don't speak to any sell side analysts. We don't read their research. So everything that we do is in-house that we ended up spending a lot of time covering the company that we've had. So if you can just imagine when you have five people working on average about maybe eight to 10 hours a day, and as a team collectively, we cover about 25 companies within the fund, then you can then multiply the number to, to, to work out how much time we spend of a company on a monthly basis. So that's what we do. And then we, we, we go through all the primary sources, the annual reports, the transcript, conferences, and everything. So that's what we do as an investment team. Then what we want to achieve on the back of the research is we, we want to find high quality businesses <laughs> that trades at an attractive price. Of course, many different managers would have a different interpretation of what that means, which I will take you through how we at Blue Well would see that. And at the end of the day, we want to find the best ideas in the global context. So in the, in, in the global space, if you follow the market and the same world, there's about 1500 stocks. Of course, even with five people on the team, we can't cover the world. So we cover about 100 companies that we deem as high quality. And within that 100 companies, we would then try to find the best 25 stocks that we can invest into at any one point in time. So that's what we try to do. And then we, if that's a new idea that appear to be attractive, then we would, that has to compare on a life for life basis, whether it's good enough for the fund, because it would, once we get to that limit in, in terms of how many stocks we can own in the fund, there is one in and one out of beta's. So what I want to focus on today is to pop it a little bit more in terms of how we see quality. I'll give you an example in a minute. And the way that we go about this is we, I mean, it, it would not be dissimilar to how people think about this, but it's just how we translate that into companies, which, which I would give you some examples later on, is we want company that has a strong competitive positioning that could deliver a high return on investment capital. And the one way to, to gauge that is if you are buying a product or buying the services from a company, and if the switching cost is very high, versus that a switching cost being very low, then it kind of implies that the company, in terms of the business model, is very sticky. That, so I'll give you one example. Like if you are uh, a Netflix user, or if you're a Uber user, if you're a Zoom user, the switching cost of moving to another platform or another service provider is quite easy. If you see that Uber is now ch having this massive surcharge, on your cap, you might go to Capify, you might go to uh, Free Now. There's many alternatives. So in terms of the lock key, it's very low. And at the same time, if you look at Netflix, the switching cost is equally low because now with inflation narrative of disposable income being squeezed, then if we want to man uh, manage our, our, our finance better, then maybe we would turn on Netflix for a few months and then we go to Disney Plus for a few months, we go to Now TV for a few months, and so hence the switching costs are quite low. But in contrast, if you happen to be uh, Office 365 Microsoft users in terms of ecosystems, then it's almost impossible to get away from the ecosystem. And if you have followed us, uh, you would have 
heard me saying this over, uh, over the last year, that Microsoft have just increased their prices in terms of subscription by about 50 to 20%. So as a company at Blue Well, that we just realized that in this coming year, we're going to pay 15% on top of what we were paying before. But that's no, literally no alternative of where we can go. That's what we mean by uh, a company with short competitive positioning that would then deliver high return on investor capital profile. Then of course, at the same time, you want the company to be able to grow, to have opportunities to, to take a bigger share of the world GDP in the next couple of years. So if they're selling some critical services, if our, some of our disposable income is going to end up in with this company, then we want to invest in with this company. And, all, and, and, and then of course, then we also look at the uh, free cash flow delivery of the company, whether it's we can have a high level of confidence that the certainty of them achieving that journey is, is much higher than some other company that maybe the scenario probably on a probability basis would be a bit wary. Then a uh, strong balance sheet is something we look at. And if you look at the uh, composition of the portfolio, most of our stocks are on a net cash basis. So if interest rates are now much higher than you can imagine that some of this company are actually earning some income on the back of that cash on a balance sheet. And obviously the last point would be management team. You need to, and if you want your company to be run by a very good management team. So this stock is my, it's my favorite stock within the fund. So I'm not sure how many people are familiar or follow NVIDIA. You might have heard me say this last year as well. And I think this would be a good example of how we can kind of marry the what what is in the business, what they're doing with what we're looking for, which is which we deem and be there being a very high quality business. So I think firstly that competitive positioning is very strong. And if you actually follow the company in terms of the GPU that they do, they have a programming language called CUDA. So even though like AMD would have some sort of equivalent product in the GPU space, but then because if you're a student, you're at a university, you will be trained to program in CUDA. So you need to have the programming side of the fence to, to utilize the GPU, which is a bit like a CPU, but CPU is one standard and C GPU is completely different. And then if you look at the different opportunities that where NVIDIA's product is going into is enormous. So if you follow the history of NVIDIA historically, maybe five to 10 years ago, is mostly about gaming. So if you're famous, you would know that you would have got a NVIDIA GPU on your PC. It would be, the graphics would be much better. And it seems that NVIDIA GPU has been heavily utilized within the crypto mining space. If you follow that, you will be buying multiple GPU to mine Bitcoin or Ethereum. But as seen as then is what we are really attracted to NVIDIA, obviously it's not based on crypto mining or, or the gaming element. It's all about the artificial intelligence, about the 5G robotics, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. And then if you look at some of this opportunity, what's happened recently about ChatGBT, if you haven't used it, I would recommend you to use it, that it literally just opened up like like a massive round of opportunities. And I think if you follow uh, uh, Jason Fong, who's a, a found co-founder of this company, he would be suggesting that the chat, the arrival of ChatGBT is like an iPhone Roman for the artificial intelligence, because this is the first time that artificial intelligence could be used by the general population, not just being exclusively used by uh, the Google scientists or engineers or some healthcare and, uh, experts. So everyone can take advantage of some sort of artificial intelligence to enhance their productivity or enhance of what they do on a day to day basis. And obviously they have, they do have a very strong balance sheet and very, uh, big, um, market, uh, kind of market share in terms of what they do. And so if you ask me to make a bet that I would suggest that Nvidia could become the next trillion dollar company at the moment, it's just short of snap hundred. Billion, and we'll see how, how long it might take, hopefully not too long, that Nvidia would be the next trillion dollar company. So that is what I've got here uh, to just to marry that back to how we define a high quality business. So 
this is quite a big slide, so I would try to run through this as quickly as I can. If you have any questions, I would, uh, Ed and I would be around for the next hour or so, so I'm happy to go into this in more details in terms of how we're thinking about the world now. So in terms of our approach, we run a high conviction portfolio to invest into high court businesses in terms of, uh, and, and they, they need to be trading an attractive valuation. So that is what we do. But then if you follow what we were doing in the last, in the first five years of the farm, those opportunities would be quite different to what we have on here. But then what we're seeing now in the next five years is we see the world have shifted in terms of the new world order, in terms of the geopolitical uncertainty, it's not going, we're not going back to the good old days in the next five to 10 years. And of course, and as far as a company or sector is concerned, that would, some of this company or sectors weren't used to benefit in the previous five to 10 years environment, they are now going to benefit in the next five to 10 years. So the first two I already talked about is these companies that we were investing into before already, and BDF, we still like Microsoft, we still like Vitva, Viva is the C, uh, customer relationship management software provider for healthcare companies. So their top customers would be uh, the Plaxo, the Johnson Johnson, and it's a software company. So if, and also at the same time, if you need to uh, take a truck from stage zero to a stage being approved, then you need to use the Viva clinical trial software and you document a lot of data before you put your truck uh, forward to the FDA. So we still like those companies. And then the other one, which is a very interesting one, is about uh, semiconductors equipment company. So the tool that we have on our top 10 is ASML and LAM research. And basically, if you follow the sector, it's quite volatile. So our timing weren't perfect last year, that last year the shares has gone down a lot. I think since then to recover quite a bit. But if we really follow what happened in the sector, it is historically, semiconductor equipment is a lot more cyclical because if the product will be going into your smartphone, into your PCs, into the different gadgets in, in terms of the electronics. But then going forward, we are really talking about silicon sovereignty, which means that we want to be risk away from Taiwan or Asia Pacific. And if you follow what happened in the industry, that's about $300 billion coming in here to build new foundries in the US, in Europe, in Japan, and in South Korea. So what it means is in the next five years, the whatever the cap, 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 uh, capability that is being uh, kind of uh, center in Taiwan now is going to be duplicated. So if you're selling the mission critical equipments, which you need to have that in the foundry to make your semiconductors, mm -hmm. then they're going to sell many more of that equipments compared to the last five to 10 years. So this is a new, new thing that has not been the case before in the last, in the last era. And then on the back of that, we're decreasing uh, uh, the, maybe the risk of the globalization or maybe opportunities on the back of the globalization. I think there's a lot of French shoring. There's a lot of things that it, it, it's not a new thing in terms of people want to reshore. If you follow Donald Trump, uh, back in 2016, he, or before he got elected, one of his motto was to make America great again. And one of the rationale for that is to have a lot of product to be made in the US. And of course, no one listened to him, it's too expensive. And then once he got elected, it, people really forgot about what, what he said, what he promised. And it seems that we have the narrative repeated again during the pandemic. And if you recall during the pandemic, there was a lot of uh, disruption in supply chain and we couldn't get the product we want at the time. And then many companies or government would suggest that, oh, maybe we want to have some of these products to be made locally so that at least we can get it in time that we don't want everything to be shipped from some low cost region in Asia Pacific. And of course, during the pandemic, the what would have the ability to do anything because everyone is just trying to survive to, to, to conserve uh, their, their cash uh, position. But now I think we're on the back of Ukraine crisis, on the back of what the new geopolitical uncertainty is going to be in the next five years, by the 10 years, my company, global company, are taking this more seriously now. So the two companies that we have got involved with is the, uh, the US railroads. One is called Canadian National Railway. The other one is Union Pacific. 
And these two companies would connect the West Coast of the US to Canada and to Mexico. And we actually say Mexico is going to be a net beneficiary on the back of that because it's very close to the US. You can expect there's going to be a lot more uh, production that's going to take place in Mexico. And then you will need to have the railroads to link them up uh, to deliver the goods to, to the Americans. And then the, the next one, which is something quite new to us, if you haven't followed us, then you would have only seen this in the last six to nine months that we have made our first investment into an energy company, which is called Canadian Natural Resources. It's a bit controversial because I think some people who didn't follow us that closely, they would say, oh, energy company is low quality. It shouldn't, it doesn't fit your bill. Why are you going into energy? We agree with that stance because most energy companies are low quality. They are highly cyclical. They are very capital expenditure dependent. The cash flow conversion is very low. Most of some of these bigger energy companies, they operate in some high risk uh, regions or uh, places and, and inflation is not good for that because they, the, the cost of running some of this offshore plant is, is, a bit, it, it is quite high. But the company that we ended up finding that fit our criteria is, is called Canadian Natural Resources. And what this company have is they have one of the longest life reserve for, for, for oil or oil sands is about 40 years. So what it means is they don't have to reinvest every year to build out a new field to, to, to take advantage of the opportunity. They already have a very long list of reserve. At the same time, the cost of production is sub 30 to $40. So our view on in terms of the energy market, even though we don't really forecast the oil price, we don't think, need to think oh, oil price is going to go back to $100 or 150 our view is like is the energy price is going to stay at about 80 70 to 80 dollars and if you're producing oil at about 30 to 40 you're going to make a lot of money as far as the company's concerned and a lot of this cash is being is going to be redistributed to shareholders because they don't need to use those cash to invest into new oil fields when they have such a long list of reserves so this is something quite new the next one uh, something i've spoken before is if you're aware about inflation that Mastercard and Visa would be a good place to be because what they do is they take a commission on the back of our nominal spend. So if we go to a restaurant now, you see the prices is 10% higher. That's what Mastercard and Visa is going to charge you is 10% higher in terms of the commission. So, so that they are, are very good inflation hedges. And also our view about in inflation is on the back of the globalization, on the back of geopolitics uncertainty, inflation is going to stay higher or settle down at a high level compared to pre-pandemic. Pre -pandemic. We don't think inflation is going back down to 2%. It, it's not going to settle down at 10%, obviously, but it could be at 4 to 5%. So, which means that like, we said MasterCard is going to have a natural tailwind in terms of how much more money they can make in the next couple of years. The next one is a more difficult one. I probably don't have time to go through too much on Charles Wall if you follow what happened in the US recently about SVB bank blowing up and also Credit Suisse. Um, we don't think it's going to impact Charles Schwab uh, as much, but if you follow the share price of Charles Schwab, it's actually gone down a lot. We think it's, they're going to resolve that in the, in, in, the, in the next couple of months or next couple of quarters. But our view on Charles Schwab is we do believe that interest rate is going to stay higher for longer. So, so I had Charles Schwab would be a good place to be. The last two is just, we also invest in domestic or equipment companies, which is in bio, logics and diabetes. Um, you can find more information about some of these options on our website. So we have written a short narrative on some of these opportunities. So happy to feel free to go to see that. This is just our top 10 company. If you have not seen that, the next two chart is the interesting one that you don't see it on our website. The bottom right hand, uh, right hand chart is just to show that in terms of where the revenue is being generated from our portfolio. So if you look at our fact sheet, it's done by the geographic allocation is done by listing. So we have about 60% in US equities or North American equities. But if you look at where they are making their money or generating their revenue, we only have about 44% and then we have a lot more in Europe and Asia Pacific. The, uh, other, uh, the chart above is just how we define certain opportunities. So technology is about quarter of the fund based on how we 
uh, defined on uh, defined their exposure through end market, and then we have financial services, healthcare, etc. So this is the performance. If you haven't followed fund, last year was a very difficult year. But what has been quite interesting, if you follow the market last year, that basically the 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 the, the, the period with the most volatility and the heavy snap off took place in the first half of last year. And if we follow the market from July onwards until today, that the market has actually gone up, and we have recovered some of the performance. But we are still, uh, we we I mean, we're not out of the woods yet. We're still trying quite hard. So that's where we are. If you want to find more information, you can come to our website, Twitter. Thank you.